go to week four, which is technically the halfway point for the end of the semester. I know it seems like we just got started, but summer class is supposed to be really fast. Today is the early republic. We're going to talk about the first three presidents of the United States. And let's see what we get here. We're going to start with what's called the Federalist Era. This is going to be President Washington and President Adams. And let's start with the very first, the original, George Washington. Now, I said it last week, he wasn't the best general, but he becomes a very good president. Uh, George Washington, he's going to be completely unopposed. He was the commander of the colonial army, and he's very cautious with everything he does. And the reason he's cautious with everything he does is, well, Frank, frankly, he knows he's set his precedent. Everybody's looking at him to see what's going to happen next. And he's going to appoint secretaries. Just like today, we have secretaries of the cabinet. He had secretaries, too. And Alexander Hamilton... Secretary of the Treasury. Henry Knox is going to be the Secretary of War. Today, that's the Secretary of Defense. Thomas Jefferson is going to become the Secretary of State. Edmund Randolph will become the first Attorney General. And then a man named Samuel Osgood will become the Postmaster General. And believe it or not, the Postmaster General is probably the most useful of those original secretaries simply because without the postmaster general, news didn't travel. For the first legislature, most of the people who are going to be elected to Congress come from the Federalist camp. There are a few anti-Federalists, but not many. And the very first order of business is to amend the newly ratified Congress. Remember, there were two states that did not sign, and the new government is going to try and find a way to get them on board. And there are 12 amendments passed, but only 10 of them are ratified. Although the 11th one has recently been ratified, even 240 something years later. Now, of these 10, we know them better as the Bill of Rights. So that gives you the freedom of religion, the freedom of press, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, the right to, to arm bear, more like the uh, right to bear arms, unreasonable search and seizure, the rights of accused people to have a trial, jury in front of their peers, no cruel, unusual punishment, and then the Tenth Amendment reserved rights. The state. And the 11th Amendment, if you're curious, it's eventually passed in 1992. Uh, it became the 27th Amendment, even though it was the 11th Amendment proposed. And that has to do with giving a pay raises to Congress. Then we have the judiciary. This is going to be founded by the Judiciary Act of 1789. And that's what puts Article 3 of the Constitution into action. Now, originally there were six U.S. Supreme Court justices. Today there are nine. There are 13 district courts. Originally there was one for each state. And then there were three courts of appeal as well. John Jay is going to become the first Chief Justice. And that's a picture of Mr. Jay right there. Now, what happens during Washington's presidency? Well, as I said, Washington, he's very cautious in taking actions. He, he doesn't want to be seen as being a dictator. Um, he, people were wondering, should they bow to him? What should they do? And he just said, call me Mr. President and shake my hand. Alexander Hamilton is going to push for national dominance, dominance in the economic purview. Um, like he consolidates the state and the national debt from the revolution. He creates the first national bank of the United States. 
even though that wasn't anywhere in the Constitution, he's going to claim that it falls under the necessary and proper clause of Article 1. And the National Bank is going to become a clearinghouse, basically. That's where currency exchanges are done, and that's where monetary values are, are decided and things like that. So ultimately, the First National Bank, its job is going to be to pay off the war debts and raise money. And it's going to do that by passing an excess tax on distilled liquor. And this excess tax on distilled liquor is going to start something called the Whiskey Rebellion. Whiskey distillers in Western Pennsylvania in 1794, they object to this tax and they rise up and rebel against the government. George Washington himself puts on his old uniform, leads the army out to Washington or out of Washington and into uh, to Pennsylvania, and the rebels back down once they see that General Washington himself or President Washington himself is on the battlefield, and they don't want to disrespect him or or fight him. In the end, they agree to a lower tax and everybody is happy. There are gonna be some partisan politics that develop. Uh, one of the things that drives this partisan development is foreign relations. The French Revolution begins in 1789. Some of the people in the United States think it's, it's fair to turn around and help the king of France, while others say absolutely not because we just fought off a monarchy to become a republic. And it's gonna break down into two camps. There's gonna be the Federalist camp and there's going to be the Republican camp. Now these are not the Federalists and Anti-Federalists from a couple of years ago, and they're not really parties. And it's really also important to know that these are not the same Republicans that we have today. Uh, the Federalists, they believed in a stronger national government. They were generally concentrated in New England, but could be found in other sections of the country as well. And these Federalists believed the young nation was threatened by a host of enemies. Uh, there are internal enemies, there are external enemies, there are people just waiting to pounce and see the United States fail. These Federalists, they emphasize the need for stability and for law and order and they didn't trust the masses. They had no need or no trust for the public. Republicans, they thought that the states are going to better protect the people. They came primarily from the mid-Atlantic, primarily from Southern states. Uh, they have a bright, rosy political future and economic future for the United States. They think things are gonna go fine. They don't think that there are any internal enemies. They're only worried about external threats and they don't even think there's many of those. And they, these Republicans, they wanted wider political participation. And that meant, you know, amongst white males because nobody else could vote at the time. And these two factions, they're gonna continually snipe each, each other and they don't really like each other. And it's actually the development of these two factions that encourage Washington to not run for a third term. Washington basically says, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. So then we run into president number two, and this is the first contested election. Adams is a Federalist. Thomas Jefferson is a Republican. And once again, remember, this is not the same Republicans of today. This was one of those two factions I was just talking about. The way the Constitution was originally written was very strange. Whoever got the most votes became president. Whoever got the second most votes became vice president. In other words, if you were to, to uh, use this rule in 2021, Joe Biden would be president, Donald Trump would be vice president, and I don't think that would be a good mix no matter where your political beliefs might lie. Here, Adams and Jefferson don't like each other. Adams wins, Jefferson become, Jefferson's going to become vice president. He gets second place. And 
they don't get along. Jefferson secretly works against Adams pretty much anywhere he can. The most important things that happen while John Adams is president, number one is the XYZ event. Uh, this is basically France attempting to get a bribe to steal money from the United States. In 1797, John Adams is going to send some diplomats to France. Three French agents known as Agent X, Agent Y, and Agent Z are going to demand that the United States pay them a large sum of money. It was a $250,000 bribe just to talk to the government and then a required loan of $12 million. The Americans refuse. And John Adams is going to ask Congress to increase the size of the army and build a navy. And from 1798 to 1800, the United States is going to fight an undeclared naval war with France. Adams thinks that full-blown war is unavoidable, and he asks Congress for a peacetime army. He, ex he asks Congress to expand the navy to more than 30 ships. Even George Washington is willing and offers to come out of retirement to lead the army against France. Now, John Adams, he didn't want war with France. He secretly opened talks with France and worked out a deal. Now, the Federalists were completely shocked by this because the Federalists themselves, the party or the faction that John Adams was a member of, they wanted war. And Adams said, whoa, 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 no. So when Napoleon Bonaparte takes over in France, Adams sends a new set of diplomats to talk to him. And in 1800, Napoleon agrees to stop seizing American ships and the two agree not to go to war. In 1798, this war fever that the Federal faction wanted to take control of drove the Federals to pass laws to destroy their political opponents. Uh, you have the Alien Act, and then you have the Sedition Act. The Alien Act, it's going to increase the duration it took, how many years it would took to become a US citizen from five years to 14 years. And it also gave the president power to deport or imprison any illegal or legal alien it considered dangerous. In other words, if you were in this country legally or illegally and the president didn't like you, he could have you removed, no questions asked. The Sedition Act targeted the Republican faction specifically, and it's the harshest law ever passed to limit free speech, uh, free speech in the United States. And it made a crime for anyone to write or say anything insulting or false about the president the Congress or the government. So you couldn't write anything that was insulting or false. You couldn't say anything insulting or false. Uh, just imagine you know, how that went over. Um, the Federalists would say that anything that the Republicans said was false. These Alien Sedition Acts, everybody knew that they were geared towards silencing the republics the republicans and secretly james madison and thomas jefferson who's vice president remember are going to write the virginia and kentucky resolutions to oppose the alien sedition act the virginia and kentucky resolutions it's going to argue that citizens speaking through their states had the right to decide the constitutionality of anything the federal government does. And these resolutions worked very well as propaganda and it whipped up support for the Republicans against the Federalists. The Virginia and Kentucky resolutions are also gonna be the basis of the nullification theory that we're gonna talk about later and the secession that happens before the Civil War begins. And we also have the era of good feelings. This is going to begin in 1800 with the election of Thomas Jefferson. The Constitution is reworked and no longer is it gonna be 
first place gets president, second place gets vice president. It's now going to be changed so that there are running mates. So now there is a candidate for president and a candidate for vice president. John Adams is going to keep his place. He's going to be running for president. And instead of Thomas Jefferson as his vice president, he's going to pick a guy named Charles Pickney. Thomas Jefferson no longer going to be vice president no matter what. And he is going to pick Aaron Burr to be his vice president if he were to win. Now, the way it was supposed to go is whoever you wanted to be president would get all of the electoral college votes. Whoever was going to be vice president would get all minus one. So Adams gets 65, Pickney gets 64. It worked right on the Federalist side. However, when it comes to tallying the Republican votes, Jefferson and Burr both get 73. Whoops, somebody forgot to take Burr's name off of one of the ballots. Well, it goes to the House of Representatives, and there are 36 more tiebreaker votes before Jefferson is eventually declared the winner. Jefferson is going to immediately ask for an end of factionalism. He's going to ask for unity. And that's funny because Jackson was one of the people behind the scenes muckraking and causing trouble for President, at this time, former President Adams. Thomas Jefferson is going to repeal the Judiciary Act of 1801. Now, the Federalists, they had passed a law in 1801 that said that judges were appointed for life, and Thomas Jefferson said, no way, it was way too expensive to have permanent courts and have those courts go forever and ever and ever. Jefferson's also going to have the Alien and Sedition Acts repealed since they were geared towards his political faction. Now, what happens during Jefferson's presidency? Well, only a couple of things, really. Marbury versus Madison happens. That's a Supreme Court case in 1803. You read a little bit about it. A guy named William Marbury, he is going to be appointed a position as a judge on John Adams' last day as president. The commission giving Marbury his position is not received before midnight. Adams is no longer president when it's received, and Thomas Jefferson is going to order his Secretary of State, James Madison, to withdraw the appointment. Well, William Marbury is going to go to the Supreme Court and say, hey, this is what's happening. This can't be how it goes. And the U.S. Supreme Court has to figure out, you know, where do we have jurisdiction versus the other branches of government? And how can we solve this? In the end, as you know, the court led by the new Chief Justice John Marshall, they're going to rule that Marbury has the right to the writ, meaning he has the right to bring the lawsuit. He has been harmed, but the law giving the court the right to hear the case was not constitutional, meaning Marbury was right to take it to court, but he took it to the wrong court. And what this is the most important for is it gives the establishment of judicial review. The Supreme Court decides with this case, they cannot go beyond what's stated in the Constitution. They cannot make law. They can just determine established law. We also have the Louisiana Purchase. Last we talked about Louisiana was with the Seven Years' War, France losing and giving up all of its territory in the United States. Well, in world history, the government of France and the government of Spain became very closely related. Napoleon is going to appoint his brother king of Spain, and suddenly Napoleon's brother, the new king of Spain, Spain is going to give France a lot of land in the New World. 
Well, Napoleon, his war is not going so well in Europe, and he realizes, you know what, I don't really need this land in North America. Why don't I sell it to somebody? And Thomas Jefferson orders the U.S. government to purchase all this land from France. And it's going to be 827,000 square miles of land purchased from France for $15 million. It's about three cents per acre. Now, how much land was this? It was mostly the middle of the country. It was Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, Missouri, uh, Oklahoma, partially Kansas, North Dakota, South Dakota, parts of Montana, parts of Idaho, uh, Minnesota, and this is one I'm missing, Iowa, and Nebraska. All of that is bought from Louisiana in the year 1800. Once the land is purchased, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark are told to go and explore. They sail up the Missouri River. They make it all the way to the Pacific Northwest. They see the Pacific Ocean. They say, yep, that's an ocean. And they turn around and they come back and they tell Thomas Jefferson everything he sees in between. Another gentleman named Zebulon Pike is ordered to explore Colorado and New Mexico, and he's eventually going to establish something called the Santa Fe Trail. Now there's pretty solid disputes between the Republican uh, faction and the Federalist faction, and because of it, no third term for Thomas Jefferson. Since he's not running for a third term, he's going to ask his Secretary of State, James Madison, to run. And James Madison wins very easily. Uh, just give me an idea. James Madison in 1808 gets 122 electoral college votes. Charles Pinckney, his opponent, gets 47. And then a guy named George Clinton, president, not president, but the governor of New York, he gets six and ends up being the vice president. So James Madison becomes president in 1808, and what's he best known for? Well, it's the War of 1812. Some people consider this the second war of American independence. Now, you can see there the causes, the impressment of American British sailors, the USS Chesapeake affair, the wars of Napoleon, and this huge war movement in the United States. Just to simplify that for you, British ships were stopping American ships and taking off American sailors and claiming that they were runaway British and they were being kidnapped from American ships. On top of that, the USS Chesapeake is attacked by the British Navy and it almost sinks and people are very angry and suddenly but with the wars of Napoleon, England or Britain, whatever you want to call it, is stopping all trade with France and the United States. They can't make their money. So what happens in the war? The United States completely unprepared. Most of the fighting is on water. Very little of it is on land. And the Washington area is invaded and burned by the British Redcoats. In reality, the war is mostly a draw. And the war officially ends December 1814 with the Treaty of Ghent. Neither side really gains anything from the treaty either. The two most important things that happen, Native American resistance in the Midwest is crushed. A leader named Tecumseh and another leader named Prophet fight against the U.S. Army and they lose a decisive battle in Indiana at Tippecanoe Creek in 1811. In the southeast, future President Andrew Jackson is going to fight the Creek Nation and Andrew Jackson will defeat the Creek Nation in March of 1814 at Horseshoe Bend, Alabama. While all of that is going on, 
There's a convention that gets going in Hartford, Connecticut by the Federalists because they think that the war is going to be lost. So you have these Federalist people meeting in Hartford, Connecticut in 1814. They're discussing ways to either revise the Constitution or to completely abandon the Republic. Some of the members outright call for secession from the, from the uh, convention as well, which would have paused the use of the United States Constitution. Now, when the war ends and it comes to light that the Hartford Connection is going on, the Federalist Party look like complete traitors and they look like idiots, too, because the United States claims they win. After Madison comes a gentleman named James Monroe. And James Monroe is going to be his job, and it's going to be James Madison's job before him to rebuild the war, or rebuild the United States after the war. And the plan they're going to use is called the First American System. And it called for the support of the federal government in helping to create internal improvements to the nation and its economic infrastructure. Now, what were the elements of this system? One, there is a need for a national bank. Number two, high tariffs to protect the American the American, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Economy, I guess I'll say, from outside goods, from foreign goods. And then John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay, they're going to claim that the government needs to build roads and we can rebuild canals, but Madison's going to say, no, 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 we can't use federal money to When James Monroe is elected president in 1816, he's going to continue this view. Yes, we need a national bank. Yes, we need protective tariffs. But no, uh, the United States government should not build roads and we should not build bridges. Now, this first American system is also going to lead to the Supreme Court case, McCullough versus Maryland, in 1819. Uh, basically, Maryland places a tax on any bank not chartered in the state of Maryland. The National Bank, of course, is not chartered in the state of Maryland. The United States Supreme Court is going to say that only Congress can create a, a bank, and only the United States Congress could charge a nationwide income tax. And Maryland doesn't really have any way to stop the U.S. bank from coming into Maryland. Some other things that happen, the United States is going to seize the panhandle of Florida during the War of 1812. And then in 1819, the United States is going to take more of Florida from Spain in exchange for about $5 million. We also going to have the expansion of slavery. Um, according to the Constitution, the outside slave trade was to stop in January 1st, 1908, meaning no longer could you bring people from anywhere else other than just those who are uh, like, the only slavery you can have is perpetual slavery that is self-funded, if that makes any sense. You can't bring in slaves from Africa or, or elsewhere anymore after 1908. Well, everything goes fine until 1819, and when the Missouri Territory petitions to become a state, it wants to do so as a slave state. And anti-slavery supporters do not agree with that. Pro-slavery supporters say, yes, please do it. Well, eventually there is this compromise that's worked out. Missouri is going to be admitted as a slave state. Maine will be created out of parts of Massachusetts, and Maine will become a a free state where Missouri is a slave state, and any new state above the bottom 
border of Missouri can no longer be slave. All right, so that's just a real quick view of this. Uh, there's more in the textbook, of course. For next week, it is your midterm exam. And I do want to let you know that there will be a video next week. It will be relatively short. It's going to be about your research essay. I want to make sure that you start thinking about that because there's only about a month left before you have to turn that in. So I want to make sure you're thinking about it. Any questions about any of this, the Federalists, the Republicans, the the Alien Sedition Act, the War of 1812, anything, just send me an email and I'll answer you as quickly as I can and get those answers for you. Good luck studying, good luck on your test, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.